Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon His return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. I've got a river of life. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to the sea. Open trees and doors and the captive free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. Well, praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, just before we get into our study, why don't we go to a quick word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon our time together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to gather together in your name uh, by this media, and we ask you, Lord, to touch our lives, uh, anoint us with the Holy Spirit, that we both might be able to hear and receive, uh, and also to give forth under the anointing of your Holy Spirit. And so now we ask that to the glory of God, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, I want to remind you, we've been on a series entitled, uh, God's Formula for a Peaceful Home. And I think every one of us want that. We're going to be dealing with a situation that uh, I have experienced many times in counseling. Uh, couples that have been going through marital problems and uh, somewhat disillusioned with what uh, they're experiencing in their home life. And uh, one of the big problems is that, as we've been teaching you, the man, the husband, has not taken the responsibility and the leadership in the home that God designed him, in fact gave him the responsibility for fulfilling. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. And the, the big question that often came as we were talking and counseling with others was, well, Pastor, I want to be a good husband, but to be honest, I don't know how. I don't have a clue. How can I do that? Well, I want to just take you through a few things here that might help you. Uh, first of all, I want to, all of you to be reminded that the material we've covered up to this time is the basic foundation that God laid out for the home of his people, his uh, kingdom people, uh, that uh, serve him. And we need to remember that God's standard and God's purpose and, and God's uh, uh, ministry uh, to those in marriage and his kingdom are much different than what the world receives and from the ideas and the activities and the customs and all of the stuff that goes on uh, in the worldly realm, which as you'll recall, I call Satan's kingdom. God's kingdom is here on earth, don't misunderstand me, uh, but it hasn't come into its fullness yet in, in taking over this earth and ruling as the Lord promises to do when he returns. And so in the meantime, we've got to deal with some things, don't we? The first thing we want to talk about today is the fact that the Christian home cannot be based on an ungodly foundation. 
Now, we laid that foundation out for you in uh, lessons number one and two, and um, we want now to just make a statement that's pretty important. Uh, we recognize that for most who are listening, uh, they have not uh, uh, been able to apply that uh, foundation because they didn't even know anything about it. Uh, perhaps were not even believers when they were married and tied the knot and became one flesh husband and wife. And so you might say, well, Pastor, it's, it's hopeless for us because we were already married and we didn't know. And, but I want to tell you a little secret. It's not hopeless for you. And uh, I'll get into that in just a little bit. But you need to know that uh, God will give you, as you turn to Him and put your trust in Him, a new beginning. And first of all, I want to, I want to just uh, go to a thought that I think all of you are pretty well aware you need to do a little work on. And that is knowing who you are. You see, there are a lot of people, especially men, and I, I guess today I'm talking basically to men, but also to wives, because you wives are the other half of your man, and you're one flesh, and so uh, you can be either a help or a discouragement unto your husband in helping him to meet his responsibilities as the head of the home. Now, as we deal on the subject of knowing who you are, you may say, Oh, Pastor, I know who I am. I mean, after all, I've been going by this name since I was a, a baby, and um, I know who I am. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about knowing who you are, not by name or title, but by the man himself, the real you, that fills out that fleshly body of yours. And so, how do I do that? Well, the first thing we need to do is to come to the point wherein we recognize that God gave us a very special, a very peculiar, and a very responsible position as the head of our home. Yes, I know you may have been married before you knew this. But as you have come to that point, or do come to that point, wherein you say, Jesus, I know you died for my sin. I know that I need to serve you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I want to follow through with baptism in water, as Acts 2.38 declares that I should. And, and, uh, but, but I don't really know how to go about the business that I know you created me to perform. And so I'm going to try to help you there. The first thing that needs to happen is that you need to come to the realization that you, number one, are appointed of God. You are empowered by God. You were designed by God, with thereby being equipped to do the job. And you were positioned by God when he declared that you were to be the head of the house and, and uh, that uh, uh, your wife was to be as the church. And uh, so as we deal with these things, just like a, a, a police officer or a corporate president or a manager of a department in the corporate world, uh, you don't do what you do because uh, you just uh, think, well, I've got to say this and do that and make that decision. You act upon the authority that has been given to you by those people that you answer to. Well, now, don't we answer to God, men? Yes, we do. And if we answer to God then, and we realize that God uh, created us, uh, gave us the responsibility of position, gave us the authority in that position, and brought us to a place where we know that we're supposed to function in that position, we need to take the attitude that I am here in the authority of my Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. And God my Heavenly Father. Now, when we begin to take on that understanding and recognize that attitude, we don't get all puffed up in self-righteousness or let a little bit of power and authority go to our head and abuse it, but rather, as God told we men to, 
to be careful to do, we are supposed to treat our wives as Jesus treats the church. Well, now you and I and our wives and our family are part of the kingdom of God, part of the church. So we are in charge. Think about this. We are in charge of a unit in the kingdom of God that shall rule and reign with him throughout the ages to come. As a result, we have to recognize uh, not only who we are, the responsibility we've been given, the position that we are supposed to fulfill, and the command of the Lord that we are supposed to uh, watch over our family as he watches over for the church and cares for it. Powerful thought, is it not? So with that, when I come to the place where I understand I'm not walking in my words, my authority, my ability, I'm not going to be puffed up with pride. I'm not going to abuse the power that God has given me. I'm going to try to learn the character and the, and the methodology that the Lord Jesus Christ has when he deals with his church, with his bride. And in order for me to be like Jesus as a leader, I have to know what Jesus was like, do I not? So, I need to conduct myself as a spiritual professional. Oh, pastor, I'm just a new Christian. I've only been serving the Lord for a little while. And uh, I, I, I'm not a spiritual professional. Oh, yes, you are. You may not know the word like you will come to know it later. You may not know all of the workings and the movements of the Holy Spirit within your life and family, as you'll come to know it later. But you are the spiritual entity, whether you like it or not, that God has set over your household, and you're responsible for the attitude, the atmosphere, uh, the situational uh, problems that come your way, and you're responsible to handle them in a, a mature spiritual fashion. Well, I'm not mature and I'm not real spiritual. I want to be, but I'm not. What can I do? Well, the next thing you need to do then, first of all, begin to read the Word of God. Oh, you don't have to spend seven, eight hours a day reading the Word. Oh, it would be nice if you could. Uh, but you take time every day to read the Word of God in some portion. And the Word of God is a living Word. It's not like a print on a book. Yes, we have it on a book, the Bible. But uh, even as print on a book, it's alive. Uh, when we read it, it brings forth truth. It brings forth uh, uh, ability. It reveals unto us uh, wisdom and knowledge and how to conduct ourselves. And we become familiar as how we're to function as a leader within our home. And as we look at that, we, what, what's the secret here? Well, you'll remember that Jesus didn't get riled up very often. In fact, the only time I can really say that the Lord got riled up, well, there were two times. One was when he told the Pharisees that they were a bunch of vipers and that their father was the devil and the truth was not in him or them. He wasn't particularly happy at that point, was he? And he took authority and took charge of that element that was threatening the kingdom of God, the bride of Christ. You and I as husbands need to come to the point that we see something happening that is threatening the spiritual well-being and the, and the truth of the Word of God within our household. We need to become a little indignant, yes, and we need to take some authority, absolutely. And we need to rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus who has given us the power and the authority to use His name to do so. Uh, but then uh, we need to remember that most of the time, oh, there was another time that Jesus got uh, sort of upset, wasn't there? And that's when the money changers had uh, uh, turned his temple, the sacred place, the house of God, had turned it into a place of gambling, uh, thieving, lying, cheating, stealing, and uh, he'd had enough of it, and we know what he did. Took a whip and chased them all out of, out of the temple uh, himself, uh, 
I don't think any of the disciples had a whip. He took charge and took over and got the job done. And there may be times when you and I need to do that. But remember, the attack was not against his people, his bride. The attack was against the enemy of his people and his bride. And so, one of the big mistakes that we men make is that we find ourselves getting upset because something hasn't gone right in uh, the situational condition of the home during the day, the week or the month. And uh, after a while, uh, we get all uptight, and we become angry, and we begin to rail upon the wife, or say ugly things to the wife, or uh, blame the wife, or perhaps we come to the point where we've just had uh, so much of it that uh, we just feel like, what's the use, and we throw up our hands and walk away. Well, Jesus never did that, did he? And we can't do that either. So, what do we do? We keep calm. We keep calm not within our own emotion, we just control our own emotion. But we keep calm in the knowledge that in whatever situation we find ourselves, we can lean upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit in the realm and the knowledge that we have, the understanding that we arrive at, and know that God will lead us through that particular situation. And so when I find a, a need for correction or discipline or uh, instruction uh, to my wife and family, I don't come in and say, now, I told you this is the way it's supposed to be, and I expect it to happen. Do you understand that? Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not the way Jesus treats the church. We need to remember to keep a calm, quiet voice and tone. And we approach the situation and say, Now, now, honey, if it's a child, now, son, daughter, this is not appropriate within our home, and it's certainly not appropriate within your life. And this is what God expects of you, and this is what I, as the leader of the household, feel God would have us to do and to be and to become. And so, in a calm, steady, but assertive and sure voice, knowing that we speak in the authority of the Word of God and the commission that God created us to perform, we give counsel, we give guidance, and sometimes we have to uh, be uh, somewhat uh, remedial uh, in uh, situations and find solutions uh, that uh, others uh, uh, in the household can't see or understand yet. Uh, but we need to take that point of calm authority. Now, I don't know how many times you have been in a, oh, a congregational setting or a, a setting in a room where there's several people gathered together and somebody walks through the door. Now, you don't know who they are. Uh, you probably have seen them before, but maybe you have not. And, but when they walk through the door, they don't say anything. They walk in. They begin to greet somebody, shake hands, maybe hug someone. But there's something about them that immediately draws your attention to them and you recognize that this is a person of authority, position, and surety within themselves, himself, if we're speaking about men. And as that happens, even though no one perhaps knows who or what or why or how that person is there, there's something about the way he walks in the room, conducts himself, and begins to uh, interact with those within the body that have just viewed his entrance. You say, well, Pastor, yeah, I've seen that. I, I understand that. Well, what, what causes that person to be that way? Why is it that uh, uh, when that person walks in and everybody stops and looks and pays attention and somebody else can walk in and they don't even see them? It's the attitude and the self-assurance and the knowledge. Now, not the pride, not egotism, uh, not uh, uh, overwhelmed with power, but the quiet confidence that they have of who they are, what they are, how they fit into the scene, and what their responsibilities are. 
and they don't have to say a word. They just conduct themselves in a way that automatically people round about them sense that here is a figure of authority. Every husband should cultivate that ability within himself toward his family and indeed their friends. Think about it. And so you say, well, I don't know if I can ever do that. Of course you can. When you stop leaning on yourself, most men want nothing more than to be a good husband and a, a wonderful and acceptable uh, father and husband to the family. Uh, most men feel totally inadequate. Most men feel so insecure in their ability to be what they need to be as a husband and father uh, that they think that loudness or uh, vivid uh, uh, animation or that somehow or another um, uh, calling uh, someone uh, names or belittling them because uh, they have made a mistake or failed to walk in the knowledge and ability that we might think they should. Uh, and, and so we lose that position when we begin to let our emotions of the flesh animate our response to the situation. Instead of that, keep calm as a Christian man. Keep calm as a godly husband and father. Walk in the surety that the Holy Spirit will direct what you need to do and to say. Do it, yes, you can do it firmly. You don't have to be loud. You don't have to be uh, exaggerated in that motion. You don't have to uh, accuse somebody of their failures and point out about how inadequate they are. That's not the way it's done. The way it's done is... Uh, you walk in, you move quietly, you stand before your household with surety. When you speak, you speak with the authority. And loudness, by the way, does not give authority. It is the quiet, solid presentation of truth and desire and direction within a godly man who walks in the ability of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that directs his family and causes the wife to honor him and look upon him with great respect and causes the children to say, well, that's dad. And dad, when dad talks, it's time to listen. And they will treat with respect. And this contempt that we find in our young children and in our teenagers in this generation is the is the fruit of the ungodly uh, family situations and lack thereof in Babylon's system and Satan's world uh, that uh, too many of us try to mingle in with our Christian households. And you see, if we just take the authority of the stars. But pastor, my kids are already half grown before I came to know the Lord. That's all right. You know what? The Bible tells me that... Uh, when we are born again into the kingdom of God. In other words, if you came to know Jesus just yesterday, and uh, maybe your wife has known him for a long time, uh, your children, some of them may have known him, but they haven't known how to respond and to act, and they haven't been able to respect you, and you say, well, what can I do? Man, I, I've already blown it before I get started. When you come to the place that you say, I'm going to serve God, and I'm going to walk in the pathway that God set before me to walk in. And I'm going to accept the responsibility that God gave me over my household. And when you do it uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit uh, and the knowledge of the Word of God, though limited it may be, it will be enough for you to begin to take hold of the leadership in your home. And so it's important for you to know that you may be getting started halfway through your married life uh, in this kind of acceptance of responsibility as a husband father. But I want you to know if you'll take hold of it, the Lord, the Word, and the Holy Spirit will guide you, mature you quickly, and cause the respect that you 
a need to come your way. Well, now, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, it says because uh, when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Redeemer, that old things are passed away and all things become new. So when you became a new creation in Jesus Christ, you were restored into the kingdom of God and God's spirit and God's word and the knowledge that you need for the moment is immediately at your disposal if you'll just take time to say, Lord, you may have to say it under your breath. You may have to whisper it as you walk through the door. You may have to turn your back and the situation say, God, help me now. What do I do here? But when you turn to God, you'll find whether you're a brand new believer or whether you're not, whether you know the scripture real well or whether you don't, you will find that the Holy Spirit will come rushing in and he'll give you the thoughts and the words and, and the attitude in which you're to present them and you will be quickly in a position where God can use you and start you out on the pathway of authority, of leadership and spiritual guidance over your own household, as well as taking care of their tangible physical needs in this world. So I just want to tell you, wherever you're starting out with Jesus, Jesus wants you to pick up the harness that he's put upon your shoulders and to accept the responsibility that God has given unto you in leadership of your own household. Now, know your responsibility. I've talked about that some uh, sometime, but uh, uh, as you come to the place where you recognize your appointed authority, as I said, you keep calm, you uh, are quiet, you are constant in the way you deal with your household, and you are not to move in anger nor in fear, but in the calmness and confidence of, that the Lord Jesus Christ will use you in a special way to guide your household through the twists and turns and the attacks of the enemy that come our way in this life. And God will give you the ability from step one to begin to walk in that place of authority. And you enlarge upon that, Pastor. Well, I think a little bit. Gentleness is a wonderful thing. Every woman who loves her husband, or whether she does or not, who is submitted to her husband, has one desire. Do you remember there in the early chapter of Genesis where God said, and the woman's desire shall be to her husband? And a lot of people have difficulty analyzing that and understanding what it means. It's very simple. Every woman desires to be everything her husband wants and needs her to be. Her greatest desire is to be everything she needs to be to make her husband and her family happy and fulfilled. That's her basic desire. Now, yes, the Babylonian system has taken over our society today, and today women have been uh, brainwashed by the enemy to believe that they're in competition with their husband. Uh, that they have to prove to their children and others round about that they know as much or more than their husband. Well, isn't that exactly where Satan put Eve? He said, you know, if you'll just do this, you'll be as the gods. And that put something in Eve's heart when she yielded to that, that made her not only want to be equal with Adam, but it made her want to rule over Adam. But you see, when we come into the Lord's kingdom, that should go away. And we'll find that the godly woman, uh, whether she is... Uh, has just come into the Lord when uh, the husband came into the Lord uh, and, and received him as Lord, King, and Redeemer, or whether she's known him uh, sometime before the husband makes no difference because the same situation is there. She has become a new creation when she accepted Jesus as Lord and Redeemer and followed through with water baptism. And... Uh, uh, we talk about that often, I know, but it's part of being redeemed, believe me. 
And so we need to be gentle. And we need, instead of yelling, we need to just take them in our arms and say, Now, honey, uh, this is uh, uh, not going to get us anywhere. Uh, this is a direction that I really don't feel uh, we should be taking or an attitude that we should not allow in our home. And uh, we hold them and we love them and we say to them gently and quietly in a supportive attitude, I'm not getting on your case. I'm just trying to help, and we're trying to build a, a part of God's kingdom together that can be filled with the total peace of our wonderful Lord and Jesus the Christ. And so this is what it's all about. Well, another thing we need to remember is that we need to be compassionate. Now, when either a wife or a child uh, does something that uh, uh, after it's done, they realize was wrong, and... Uh, uh, many times they'll say, now don't be mad at me, or don't be upset, or, or don't be angry, but, uh, and they tell what they did, uh, I think I made a mistake here, I probably shouldn't have done that. Well now instead of getting on their case and saying, well now you're right, you shouldn't have done that, you ought to have known that to begin with. No, no, no. no. We take them in our arms and we say, hey, it's okay. We're going to make the best of it, and the Lord's going to help us through this, and it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Don't you worry about that. You just be concerned that uh, I'm not going to rail at you. I'm going to show grace and mercy and love, just like Jesus shows grace and mercy and love unto us, and all of us make mistakes and we fall into some kind of a trap that Satan lays for us every once in a while, do we not? Well, he doesn't rail on us. He just tells us, hey son, daughter, better get back into the true pathway because you're headed down the wrong way and I don't want to see you get hurt. And I certainly don't want you uh, to uh, be separated from the kingdom of God. I need you in my kingdom. I want you in my kingdom. You're part of my bride. And so we husbands need to take the same focus with both our children and our wives. Now, I don't know how you were raised. I was raised in a home where... I know my parents loved the Lord, but I had a situation where they didn't know or understand until later years uh, about uh, how to run a family and how to walk in the presence of the Lord. And I can remember I would do something that I didn't think was a very big deal at all. In fact, many times I didn't even realize that I'd done something I wasn't supposed to do. And uh, uh, those terrible words would come from my mother. And my mother would say, you just wait till your father gets home. Well, now the torment that that brought to me was great because I knew that in those days when father got home, mom's going to tell him what I did and so on and so forth. I wouldn't have a say and tell my side of it at all. And there would be some kind of discipline meted out to me. Sometimes, even to this day, I believe that that discipline was unjust. Why? Because it was based upon an untruth and an ungodly attitude that Satan had planted in our household. In later years, as Dad grew and Mother grew and kids grew. Uh, those things changed somewhat. But they never came to realize uh, uh, the power that we have as children of God in His kingdom that have been anointed with the Holy Spirit after we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and walk in the righteousness of our Lord and Redeemer. And so I'm speaking in some part by experience. Well, have you ever failed in that area, Pastor? Oh, yes, I have failed in that area. Have you ever failed in anything? I imagine you have. And what happens when you go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me and cleanse me? 
You don't find pushing away and anger and saying, I don't want anything to do with you, I'm tired of you. No. What do you do? You find his loving arms come and he holds you and he says, let me just give you a little illumination here. And he will gently love us, gently uh, forgive us, gently show mercy and uh, grace, and, but he'll also show some instruction and some guidance. And if we as men learn to conduct ourselves always, oh, you'll make a mistake now and then and have to apologize and ask your family and your wife to forgive you, and especially the Lord, and, but thank God they will and you will find forgiveness from your Lord. Uh, we need to learn to do that because that's the sign of leadership. Leadership is not always having to be right, but leadership is always having the right motivation, care, love, grace, mercy, and concern. And we walk in the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord helps us to stay in that realm of attitude and presence as the leadership of our household. Now, we've already talked about your responsibilities, where we've told you God created you to be a husband and a father, and to walk in authority in your household, and to be in charge of it. And so, I really don't need to go into that, I think. You don't need to be concerned about what the rest of your family members think. You don't need to be concerned about what your friends think. You don't need to be concerned about what your in-laws or your parents think. You need to be concerned about what God thinks. You and I need to remember that as children of His kingdom, His bride, our responsibility and our only responsibility when it comes to others than those that God has made us responsible for is to remember that we answer to only one, and that's Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, Redeemer, and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. So, if we satisfy the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Father, our Creator, if we satisfy Him, we need not worry about what anybody else thinks about how we run our household. And we should not let others influence how we run our household. If you have ungodly parents, they're going to think you're terrible because uh, you're either too gentle, too lenient, uh, uh, you put up with this or you put up with that. Boy, I would never do that. You better believe it wouldn't happen in my house. Well, okay. But see, we are to re be responsible to our Lord and our Redeemer. That's our boss. That's who we report to. Okay? Now, here's a problem that often comes up. Many times, a husband is the last one to come to the Lord within a household. Now, that's a, a shame, and, and, and it's a hindrance in many ways, yes. But we need to remember that uh, those who are already members of the kingdom of God already serve the Lord and husband comes in to the household a new believer anointed and equipped in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ he's in charge if it happened this morning he's still in charge he's the head of the household appointed by God so what generally happens the husband is very backward, very quiet, uh, very hesitant to take that position of authority because here's the wife that has been serving the Lord for maybe years and some of the children, if not all, are born again into the kingdom of God and serving the Lord. And so what's happened? Well, he says, I don't know the Bible. I don't, I'm new at this. I'm not prepared for this, uh, and so he withers away and diminishes himself and his position in the household, and his wife is quick to help him do that. Oh, ladies, that's a terrible mistake. Instead of helping him to do that, well, you say, well, pastor, how do I help him to do that? Oh, you help him by reminding him. Now, look, uh, how much of the Bible do you know? 
I've been serving the Lord for a long time, and I know this. Now, you may not go about it that way, uh, but you may start throwing Scripture at it. Well, now you know the Bible says this and this and this. That's not your position. That's not your responsibility. That's not your place. Your place is to say, oh, honey, I'm so glad that our family now is united in the love of God and the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that now you can take the leadership and, and, uh, and we can lean upon you. And I don't have to worry about teaching the kids everything. And I don't have to worry about all the things I've been trying to do because uh, I felt like I was in this my, by myself. No. It's time for the wife to say, praise God, hallelujah, throw your arms around him, love him, and say, you know what, I don't care whether you know any of the scripture or whether you don't. If you're going to serve Jesus, we're going to do it together as a family. And wife, never put him down because he knows less of the word of God than you do. You be there to support. Remember your half of him. Remember why God made you and created you and brought you together as husband and wife? What did he say? You are to be one flesh. You are to be his helpmeet. We've had studies on that many times. And so now it's time for you to say, Hey, I release my burden of spiritual direction over this household, and now I give that to you. And as you do that, and you let him know that you're there to support, you're there to be uh, an inspiration and a help, and you're there to yield yourself to his authority as the head of the house within the kingdom of God. And peace will abide within your home. Sometimes it's a situation where neither of you are serving the Lord, and uh, something comes up and, and uh, you both say, well, we're too late. We can't, we can't really be good parents in the Spirit. We can't do the things that God wants us to do and be in the Spirit uh, because we got a late start. Not true. Not true at all. And so it doesn't matter who became a Christian first. It doesn't matter whether uh, the wife or the husband is somewhat unlearned in the Scripture. The thing that matters is that we recognize that when we become the children of God, born again into His kingdom, that we are the children of God. And God's able to direct us no matter how immature and uncertain we may be in our knowledge and experience of spiritual things. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, I've quoted it many times, Therefore, if any man can be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I want to tell you something. Spiritual seniority does not alter gender responsibility. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, I looked up the Greek on that word, Savior, and it speaks of a deliverer, a protector, a provider as God or Jesus Christ. And so what is he saying? He's saying that the husband takes the same position in the household regardless now of when he became a Christian. Yes, he needs to be a Christian to ever take this position because uh, he's not part of the kingdom of God until he does. He may be an Israelite. He may be a Hebrew. He may be what we call a Jew today. I don't, but some do. And all of that, but it's when he comes into knowledge of, of the cleansing, redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ of, at the cross of Calvary that he now can walk in full authority regardless of seniority in the Word. It's important, you ladies, to do that 
rather than to make it a situation now of uh, a competition where you're going to show him how much more you know than what he does. Wrong step. And you'll find it will lead to a real confusion and destruction within the household. And you will be the responsible one for discouraging and, shall I say, browbeating your husband into submission that I'm in charge here. I've been in charge here for 15 years, how many years it may be, and uh, uh, you weren't there for me, you weren't there for the children, and, and, and you're going to take over the leadership of this house? The husband should say, yes, honey. I know I failed. I've asked God to forgive. I ask you to forgive. But yes, I'm going to take my responsibility in the kingdom of God. I'm going to be obedient to my Lord, and I'm going to lean upon him very heavily, but I'm going to let him guide me. And yes, honey, I'm going to take the responsible position that God created me to perform. And so that's the way it's going to be. Not in anger, not in great gyrations, not in some kind of put down and, and name calling, but in a quiet, absolute, assured knowledge of your position and standing upon the promises of God's word. I went to another uh, uh, interpretation of that word deliverer and it says, it means to rescue or bring safety, both physically or morally. The uh, intellectual world looks upon that word as meaning uh, to rescue or, or bring safety uh, physically and morally. And of course, you and I know we add spiritually to that as well. Now, therefore, verse 24 in Ephesians 5, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands um, in spiritual things. No, it's not what it says. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread it. Let the wives be to their husbands in everyday tangible things. Well, that don't sound right either. Oh, I, I misread it again. Let me read it like the Bible says. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then it goes on in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as also Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, how did we come to all this where somehow the wife feels like she has to uh, maintain the leadership spiritually and and uh, uh, take authority within the house and actually rule the husband. You and I look at the world today and we find that there are a lot of men who say, I run my household. Uh, we find also that most of those men run their household according to whether the wife says yes or no and how and when uh, is to take place within the household. And so the wife is really in charge. Well, how'd that happen? started with Satan and uh, confusing and deceiving Eve. It's followed through through the generations of history, mankind. And now we find that we live in an age where Satan has spread the word that the woman is supposed to rule over the man, which is uh, the heathen doctrines and the heathen religions of the world. Oh, they have their male prophets, but they also have their female directors. And I talked about that, I think, a week ago. And so, it says in Proverbs 12, 4, A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Now, the female gender today, commonly known as women's lib and branches of it, Take the attitude that we are to overcome the male gender, we are to uh, rebel against any of his authority, and we're going to rule him and the world. And that's the idea. Well, that's not a virtuous woman, is it? So, because of rebellion that Satan sowed in the spirit of woman, we now have a situation 
where that rebellion assumes the authority of the husband, the male gender, the male leader within the household. And as a result of that, again we have the two world kingdoms. The kingdom of Satan, which right now is running a amok through all the world, spreading poison everywhere, bringing death, destruction, damnation, and deceit everywhere it can. And now we have uh, the kingdom of God, which right now, yes, it's in the minority in the, this world, but I want you to know it's not going to be long until Jesus Christ comes back with those great allegiance of saints of God that are in the heavens today, and he's going to bring us with him into rulership over the this earth and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ as our Lord and King and you need to know that that spirit of woman will not have a place in the kingdom of God ladies remember the husband is the head of the, of the wife and that he is answerable only to God and you need to remember that you are to be in submission to your husband as he is unto Christ and you need to remember that your husband is responsible to guide you, uh, deliver you, protect you, provide for you, minister to you, that you do not fall out of favor in the kingdom of God, but in your submission to your husband as the leader and authority of your home, you become that helpmeet that God created you to be and to perform in him. And I want to say this. I don't care what kind of a career you women have. I don't care what kind of victory and, and uh, superiority you've attained. I don't care about your education or uh, your bank account. I don't care about uh, the years that you have been a Christian uh, above and beyond the years of your husband. Makes no difference to me or to God. The secret is God made you to help your husband to become what your husband can be in Jesus Christ, and you are half of him, he is half of you, you are inseparable, and as you do that together, you will find a household that abides in the quiet, perfect peace that passes all understanding in the kingdom of God. Well, God bless you. Time for us to go into communion. And I want you to understand, no, you don't have to receive communion every week. Uh, we do it every week because we have no way of knowing who was uh, able to receive it last week or the week before and may be uh, wanting to uh, serve communion and receive communion with us. So we're preparing now for communion. I hope you'll stay with us and, and join with us as we uh, take that time to give honor, reverence, respect, and glory and praise to our Lord and Redeemer for the terrible price he paid that you and I might be set free from the spirit of the law of sin and death. And so we go into verse 23 in 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Why? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. That means respect, reverence, uh, appreciate the Lord's death until he returns. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, 
that we should not be condemned with the world. I want to go back to verse 29. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now think about that. Is it possible, the next verse says, because of that, many of you are weak and sickly and many of you have already died. Is it possible that as you receive communion, you do it as a ritual instead of an act of worship and reverence and due respect unto our Lord and Redeemer? If that's the case, it could be that your illness, your sickness, your weakness, and, and in fact the, the, the fact that you have uh, had someone or are about to pass into eternity prematurely short of the time that God gave us, you need to understand that it's time to repent of that and say, Lord, forgive me and receive these things in reverence and respect as we eat and drink together. With that, let us have a short prayer, and we'll take of the bread. Now, Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We ask you to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we have been careless, indifferent, and if we have taken for granted the terrible sacrifice you gave for us, if we have been in a place where he, we have soiled the righteousness of your robes in which we are clothed, forgive us and cleanse us and renew us in the perfect righteousness of your blood, your Holy Spirit, your word, and God the Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, let us take of the bread and let us eat together. Remembering, it represents the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us eat together. Like Meyer, remember the cup represents the shed blood. It's grape juice. It was wine in those days, there's no doubt. It's wine today, it doesn't matter. What I tell you is, this represents the shed blood of Jesus, our Redeemer. And so with that, let us drink unto that and acknowledge that we give Him praise and glory, praise and glory, praise and glory, worship and thanksgiving for the work he did that we might have eternal life. Let us drink together. Praise the Lord. Well, we thank you. Trust you'll be back with us again next week. Praise his wonderful name. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at ChristianLiving101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at gene, with a G-E-N-E, gene at christianliving101.org.